Well, thanks for the invite. It's been a little while since I've done a talk like this. Um, so what I want to do is I want to set the scene for, for who we are and then sort of frame up a couple of ideas around corruption loosely tied to, to what we do. So for the last seven years, um, we've grown the entity that's now become SKB from humble beginnings. It was uh, myself and my friend John, um, who in my early 40s, he taught me to weld and drive a forklift, uh, which is a very hard left from my previous career as a very bad molecular biologist and somebody who spent 15 years in higher education teaching innovation and creativity. Uh, we started in a small 5,000 square foot space in Kensington, just in North America and Lehigh. Um, and in October, we moved into a 75,000 square foot space here in the Navy Yard. We have about 50 employees. They range from creatives, designers, design engineers, uh, into amazing fabricators and artists. And I thought it'd be helpful just to give you guys an idea of some of the work we do just to frame up some of the things we'll talk about. Um, so we work with a lot of artists. Uh, this is with a local artist called Jordan Griska. It's a life-size S-Class Mercedes built out of mirrored polished steel. Um, it's 9,600 individually laser cut, hand beveled triangles. It is possibly the world's most complicated jigsaw. Um, it often creeps up in Reddit feeds sort of a mile or with Instagram feed to argue whether it's actually a rendering or a physical asset, but it's a, it's a real thing. Um, so a project was down the um, Spruce Gate Harbor Park, but it was developed with an amazing artist called Micah Johnson. Micah was a major league baseball star <laughs> who created an amazing uh, Web3 project called Aku. Um, Aku, was, the origin story for Aku is Micah's seven-year-old nephew asked him whether astronauts could be black, and he created this amazing digital explorer. And this is an eight-foot sculpture that was CNC milled out of foam and then shell-coated and automotive body paint. Uh, we've worked with an amazing, you know, world-renowned artist called Andy Scott for a number of years. Andy um, is most famous for um, his giant horses' heads in Scotland called the Kelpies. They're about 120 feet high. Um, up until recently, Andy was a studio mate of ours when he was based in Philly. He's since moved to Los Angeles. This is one of three sculptures that we helped Andy produce that's currently at, well, at uh, Manchester City Football Club in the UK. So we started off doing large-scale art fabrication. Um, we then started building our reputation for doing architectural design build. This is a rescue spa here in Philly. Um, this is uh, De Bruyne Brothers in Wayne. Uh, Nerd Streets, a local host, is an esports training facility. We did all of their sort of interior design, fabrication, installation, and really trying to think about how to build the physical manifestation of, of what they do. Um, it's a project we just finished for, for Farfetch and Art Basel in the VIP Collector's Lounge. It's a really fun piece of creative technology that uh, when you walk up to these giant TVs, it looks at the colors of the clothing you're wearing, calls a database, creates a collage of things that match, and puts them up on screen and diffuses the over a set of custom LED screens. Um, and more recently, we've been getting into some really fun, weird stuff. So um, this is a, a really fun project called Cool Cats. It's a blockchain video game. For NFT NYC last year, uh, we built out a 23,000 square foot uh, immersive experiences based on the video game. Um, and that was in collaboration with Media Mugs. Um, really fun project where you got an NFC bracelet when you came in, you scanned that, you got points added to your, to your wristband that you could exchange for discounts and merchandise. Um, and at this project, we had an awful lot of money and it sort of charts the course quite well for the kind of things that we're getting into. But I'll come back to that a little bit later. On the, the more sort of ridiculous side, uh, in December we loaded Mariah Carey into Madison Square Garden on a giant snowflake. Mm. <laughs> um, and while this isn't on the website, and given the nature of the topic, I'm not going to too, talk too much about what we built for Kanye. But uh, it's no longer the website for obvious reasons, but it's still pretty cool. We've got to build a 24,000 square foot water stage for the Donda 2 listening party. Um, Final Creative was finalized 18 days before show and uh, a pretty mad sprint. Uh, as you can imagine, not all of these things have gone to plan. <laughs> There's a lot of difficulty and complexity in what we do. So I wanted to, to use that and unpack it as a way of sort of structuring a couple of lessons from the French hit. And I'm going to define, it is loosely, corruption as a problematic change brought about by a force of action. And I'm going to focus on three areas um, and thinking about uh, about this from, from a few of them. So 
Um, for us as a business, you know, we often have to solve. We often have to solve challenging issues, and the creative group that we have, um, we we find that a lot of the challenges are trying to amplify everybody's creative as a collective. You know, we have a number of individuals, say, from creative to design, design to design engineering, design engineering into fabrication, fabrication in, into installation. And one of the things that, that I've found through both uh, my time in higher education, teaching innovation and creativity, and the work that we do, is that um, this idea that what gets in the way of creativity and how to address it is a critical part of being able to manage you know, the kind of work that we do. So. Um, there's a, there's a great book by an American dancer and choreographer called Twyla Tharp. I think it's called The Creative Habit. And I love this book. I used to use it to teach quite a lot. And you know, what, what Twyla talked about is that, or one of the things I sort of latched onto is that when you start on any kind of creative discipline, your rate of appreciation of what good looks like accelerates way quicker than your ability to execute it. So I think most of us have you know, felt that urge, uh, particularly as you get older in life, that you, know, you, want, you need a creative outlet. You're not fulfilled in terms of your creative expression. You know, I love drawing, and so you know, I started trying to get back into drawing again. And you, know, you start watching all the tutorials, and that's got a lot easier and more accessible, and you know, that, that's all great. But one of the things that I said twice, Twyla says in her book is that that rate of appreciation and what you can do, and you, you do all the tutorials, and you work really hard at it, and then you look down at what you've done, you kind of think, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> what I was hoping for, it's the same kind of thing, you know, with baking shows as well. He's like, scrolling to Instagram, and you're like, oh, that's an amazing thing. My kids love cats, and they've got a birthday coming up, and you try your best, and you just go like, <laughs> you know, so, so what happens, what's fun is when you're a kid, you're told, like, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. And then as an adult, you're like, well, if at first I don't succeed, I should probably erase any evidence that I tried in the first place and not tell anybody, you know. So for us, managing this creative process with a lot of really talented young kids coming into the workforce has been really interesting. So a lot of what we try and do is, is sort of look at the process. Now, what's interesting in the creative sector, like I'm curious to, to hear, how many of you have been using any kind of AI creative tool over the last couple of months? There's a few. So it's really interesting. AI is really democratizing access to creative endeavors because now you can type in, imagine a light, airy, Zaha Hadid inspired multi-nodal greenhouse, click, and away it goes. You know, I ought to do <laughs> And it's really made it really much easier for a lot of people to creatively express themselves. Um, but what we're finding is, or what we're starting to see, particularly our, you know, some of our clients, some of our client conversations, just generally, there's this, while it's giving confidence in some areas, it's also creating some levels of overconfidence. You know? And we see this a lot you know, in, in various different guises. Um, so to sort of extend the thought process a little bit, um, I want to talk about the process and what the sort of forces that prevent the full expression of creativity. Because what we've found is if you're really pushing the boundaries, sometimes the universe starts pushing back at you pretty hard. Um, so let's, uh, let's think of this. So yesterday, I was sitting, <laughs> trying to think through my talk. I was playing around with mid journey. And I was like, okay, there's, a, there's a destination I want to get to, and let's see where we can go. So I typed in this prompt. And you know, 20 seconds later, I'm given you know, a bunch of inspiration images. Now, we use mid journey to create unique you know, mood boards, etc. We don't want to just be pulling stuff from Colossal or Pinterest or Instagram. Yeah, we're really trying to push the boundaries of the things that have not been done before. Um, and then it's cool. So you start looking at it for inspiration. And then you can just hit repeat, repeat, repeat. And you keep on coming up with these really interesting novel you know, concepts. Um, and the reason why I, I wanted to go down this particular route is a case study that we used to use on the sort of creative process and practical realities. So this is the, um, the art, artistic rendering, architecture rendering of, and I get the, the name right, the National Fisheries Development Board building in Hyderabad in India. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, and that's the building they got. <laughs> now, I'm going to be totally honest. I would enjoy driving past that building every single day. <laughs> 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 But it's not that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a decent way from that. You know, so, yeah, what? 
<laughs> it's so great. So, so I started unpacking this because we see this all the time. You know, it's really easy to make a few tweaks in CAD or a brush stroke and a change in a line. But yeah, what we do really at FKB is we're trying to strive to be experts in the, the idea of applied imagination. You know, the idea is the easy bit, but you know, customers, clients, they're, they're really paying for the full execution and realization of that creative. And so I thought it'd be fun just to sort of break that down a little bit. Um, and you know, we found that while a slightly unusual place, um, we found great um, enjoyment and opportunity by putting all these things under one roof. It certainly makes it complicated and challenging. But we started out with this idea based on experiences I had in my previous work, you know, teaching innovation and running these sort of innovation and creativity programs at places like MIT and Stanford. And when I was teaching at Stanford, I got the chance to work with an amazing guy called Oren Jacob. And I heard Oren talk a number of times. He was the CTO at Pixar. And when we started the company, we started thinking, well, what would it look like to be the Pixar of the built environment? And let me use a couple of things just to explain exactly what I mean. So Oren would talk about um, finding Nemo. And the way he would explain it was, at times within Pixar, story would need to go to the technical department to solve something. So in the case of Finding Nemo, when they did the first screen test, it just looked like the fish were floating in space. And so they went to the tech department and said, look, how can we create a sort of depth of field? I use this image really specifically because the tech department developed a particulate field that they were able to use within the animation software so that the particulates and the fish had that sort of gentle wobble that you have the color shift that you see underwater. It's actually an accelerated fade of depth of field and focus. And this picture represents that in a really great way. So story driving tech. On the, on the flip side of that, sometimes you get a you know, Pixar tech driving story. So when tech worked out how to do hair really well, you'll end up with Sully from Monsters Inc. So when we think about the business that, that we've built, it's never a linear process. It is in absolutely categorically never a linear process. It's super messy. You know, we have a whole range of conversations running for a while. We, the client wants this, the design looks like this, it's design engineering, then somebody from the install team reminds us it's got to go in a freight elevator and it's got to go on a truck and you know, all the other various you know, inconveniences. But ultimately, what we've been trying to do is develop this system because when this is disjointed, you land up with corruption in communication, corruption in artistic intent, and you, did, you land up with these little pockets of turbulence of understanding. And so we, we get it far from right all of the time, but it's a, a part of our process that we work on all of the time to try and mitigate some of the impacts of those. Um, so the second, oh, sorry, so it's force of parental expression. Now what I want to get into is how the kind of work that we do switches. So some people might see us as a corruption in the industry. Yeah, you know, we're trying to do something quite differently. Again, it's slightly tenuous, but bear with me. So we get uh, we get calls all the time for quite absurd um, requests. So I'll give you a for instance that would not be possible. Do we not have all of these things under one roof and a process? We had a request from amazing agency Momentum, uh, who were working with Amex for the US Tennis Open. They said, hey, can you build us a Rube Goldberg trick shot tennis ball machine that's kinetic, looks really cool, subjective, uh, <laughs> looks really fun, subjective, uh, interactive, Instagrammable, and I don't like that word generally, uh, and kinetic and reliable and has high throughput. I'm like, ah, okay, yeah, maybe. Um, so the team started putting together ideas and concepts. So this was the, the rendering um, of the idea that we came up with. Um, there's a super quick video of it running hooks used in a word. Um, and that was designed, built, and executed in six weeks. From spec. Now there's a whole bunch of custom 3D printed stuff. There's these amazing capacitive sensor buttons so you could just hobby your hand in front of it but it took absolutely every single person in the business to pull that off. And I don't think we could have done that without this integrated structure. You know, it's, uh, it's super fun. 
one of the funniest, weirdest messages I've had on I'm being in our ADS business was when this was being installed, the the ball started jamming underneath. And we have a number of amazing staff and, and one of our creative technologists, Emlyn, is, is one of the most enthusiastic people you will ever meet. She is a Labrador puppy of, of a you know, black belt creative technologist. And uh, you know, we're just before showtime and, and Emlyn decide, suddenly realizes that she needs to, she's got a soul for this situation. She runs out to CVS, buys a shaver and shaves all of the tennis balls <laughs> to reduce the friction. I'm like, wow, but I got a text saying, hey, it's all sorted, Emlyn shaved all the balls. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Los Angeles and I knew this was going wrong and I'm like, I, I'm sorry about it, sorry. Um, so this had, uh, I think, 18,000 people um, use it over 10 days. Total downtime was about 10 minutes. But the idea with it, I'm just going to hit play again if I can. The idea was it should be something that you want to queue up and use, but it should be really simple. You don't want somebody stood there for half an hour trying to master it. So the idea was make sure people get bored within 60 to 90 seconds. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of the time, the work that, we, that I've done in innovation stuff, I, we always want to ask the client, well, look, what needle are you trying to move and why? Like, I can build you something pretty. I can build you something that delivers against it. But I really want to know why you want to spend this money and what does success look like for you. So we're not a normal business. We're not a normal fabrication shop. We're certainly not a normal architecture studio. You know, we, we tend to sort of uh, articulate ourselves as an experiential innovation group. So I'm going to get into a, a much more sort of technical project and, and talk a little bit around the, the process. And we've seen these kind of evolutions in technology before. And I just did a sort of half back a reference back to AI um, in reference to this project. So this is a, a project at the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center, um, which is the fifth and market. It is by far the hardest project we've pulled off, the most technically demanding, you know, from a fabrication standpoint. Um, so we were approached by local projects of New York in collaboration with UAP, UAP Great yeah, Artistic Fabrication Shop. And local projects are the guys behind the 9-11 Memorial, Waterfalls, yeah, Brain Zero, incredible company. Um, they wanted to build this 42 foot high compound curved triple helix um, that looks like it is perfectly penetrating the building. And we had a look at it and started, sat down with everybody, tried to work out the process of, of solving it. Uh, and I just want to walk you through that process because I think it, you know, it explains a little bit of what we do and, and how we think about things. Um, so you can imagine yeah, back in there. My first piece of work experience, by the way, was working for civil engineers where I was sat in front of a giant drawing table with tracing paper, an ink pen, and a razor blade <laughs> going through drafting. Now, this kind of project would have been absolutely unachievable in the budget that the client had at those times because you know, we start modeling, you know, in this instance in Rhino, uh, at a plugin called Grasshopper, which enables us to parametrically shift part files, etc., and make changes. Um, this structure, just to give you some ideas on dimension, this is a 16 foot diameter ring beam. Um, this is a sort of double cantilever compound curve structure that's held in place by these fins. These fins are two inch thick plate steel. Just to give you an idea. So the interior of this, uh, the only way we could think of doing it, or the best way, cheapest way we could think of doing it was a CNC plywood waffle grid, you know, and then some form Corian. I kind of originally wanted it all made out of painted steel. It was going to be very difficult to achieve that compound curve and roll it in, in the ways they wanted. Um, but in this modeling software, you know, and the parametric nature of it, there is a significant AI component in it, and it's critical to what we do. You know, we were able to build part files so that when we showed the structure to the structural engineers and the professional engineers who started working out how much is this going to deflect under its own weight, you know, and how do we then offset the seams of this project so as it does settle under its own way, the, the seams are still horizontal. There's so much complexity in those projects, it's impossible to solve without the number of people and diversity of opinions that we have in, in our business. Um, so going through these power files is complicated. The sort of fabrication process is super fun. I nerd out on this stuff all the time, but we want to point out a couple of things. So this is the CNC waffle grid being made. Um, these are the uh, laminated MDF box that 
give the shape form. So we take the surface that needs to be built, CNC metal butt, cut Corian, which is normally a countertop surface for, for kitchens, heat it up in an oven, and then put it onto these blocks and vacuum form it. Um, at the time, because of the process of the project and the budget, we couldn't find a thermoforming oven big enough and quick enough, so we built our own. Uh, we couldn't find a vacuum table quick enough and cheap enough, so we built our own. Um, it was a really wild process. I'm just going to sort of skip through. Uh, on the steel yeah. side, we're like, oh, well, this is a, an inch and a quarter uh, wall size steel. And we thought, well, we can go and find somebody who can roll those dimensions. Turns out nobody could feel comfortable doing that with the level of resolution that we wanted. So we had to come up with, and on all of these are like, to, my, to me, micro corruptions of the process. You know, it's the way we had to deal with, you know, these unintended you know, moments. Um, this ended up being a faceted geometry that was built within 360s over you know, 19 feet. Um, you can see here the sort of face that receives the fin. That's just, so it just gives you an idea of what happened behind it. So all of this is leading towards you know, getting this thing installed. And you know, the normal course of operations, you know, we have an architect, and the architect finds a general contractor, and the general contractor finds a multitude of subcontractors, and we have those cavitations. It happened in this project. So what happened when we came to install and we finally got the piece installed, we found out that one measurement that had been carried out by a uh, party outside of our company um, had got a five inch error um, in, in the height of the posts that this thing sat on. So when you stood down inside and looked up, we were supposed to see this contiguous sort of curve, it was off. And so we, we, uh, we stood there for a moment, and uh, this thing, by the way, from, from the ring beam up, is 48,500 pounds in weight. Um, we had a fairly entertaining conversation with the uh, crane operator to see if he felt comfortable making the fix. Uh, it didn't. Um, but you know, sitting down, we basically realized that we could build these flanges onto the post, you know, level them up with a jack, and use inch thick steel shims, and it was solved within two days. But, you know, again, all of those things for us have been these like micro cavitations and things that get in the way of the process that we have to try and solve. Um, ultimately, it came out pretty well. Yeah, we're pretty thrilled. Um, uh, two days after um, this being installed, a hurricane came through for the pulse here. <laughs> so the first, yeah, for the first time in years. So Tom, one of our other business partners, I sat looking at that thing all through the night, rather nervous, shaking in the wind. But, uh, yeah, it's, it was all fine and, and great. So, um, so these are the areas that I thought was sort of interesting to share. And I feel that uh, we're starting to get to a position in the relationships we have, uh, the, um, the way we're seen in the marketplace to, to get in some very interesting conversations uh, where we are starting to feel like we are a cause of disruption you know, into, into various parts of the industry. So there's a couple of things that we see coming next. Uh, you see just to sort of wrap up. Um, we think that uh, experiential retail is going to grow a lot, you know, in terms of brick and mortar. We don't see it necessarily being um, where you go buy something, but more where you experience the brand. You know, we've all been around any number of shopping centers, drive around South Jersey, there's a massive oversupply of infrastructure. And as long as land ownership is a thing, then putting something in it that makes money will continue to be important. Uh, we also think that location-based entertainment, you know, is going to be a, a massive growth area, and we're starting to see a lot of that coming into Philly with other worlds and, you know, uh, immersive Van Gogh and a bunch of other projects that are sort of starting to land in the city. Uh, we think the two will start to overlap a lot more. Yeah, and that becomes really interesting in the line of work that, that we carry out. Um, then we think that uh, on the the physical build, the expectation that people have of the, when we say the real world, is increasingly influenced by their experience digitally. You know, so we're starting to see like people wanting to push the boundaries, and it's really easy to punch in a couple of prompts in mid-journey, but somebody's still got to work out how to build it if you're going to experience it, and that becomes a really interesting part for us of our of our next set of frontiers. So that's why I thought it'd be interesting to sort of break corruption up into those three areas. Um, I want to leave you with this just as a, as a final thought. Uh, it made me uh, put a smile on my face yesterday, uh, and I will attribute the quote. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, I hope that's any questions.